people don't want a best friend right? They want to like you and they Mm -hmm. want to be able to be in the room with you, but they're looking for real advice and they are looking for you to almost guide them. And some of the the toughest when they're making a decision, there's been so many times where like, what would you do? And I have to have conviction behind what I'm saying right? because it's, there's hundreds of thousands of dollars on the line. Welcome back to the Real Estate Excellence Podcast. According to Zillow, this guest today is involved in 57 transactions in the last 12 months. She's not only a top producer, but she just had a baby about five months ago. She is a director of events for the Women for Women of Jacksonville. She has just over a decade in real estate and a PR degree from UNF. Let's welcome the team lead for Houston and Tajera with Keller Williams, Carrie Houston, to the show. Hi, how are you? Carrie, thank you for coming on this morning. Thank you. I'm glad we finally got you on. Yes. You are a, you pop up on the social media mm-hmm. occasionally. I go through your social media, but what I, I really want to, we'll eventually drill a little bit when we talk about marketing in general for you, but you have a lot of, you, you blend a lot of your family, a few business stuff in there, but a lot of family yeah, on your social media. For sure. Yeah. I think that. I remember asking someone years ago when I first started, and it's been right at 10 years with residential, and I remember social media started to take off, and it was the question of, do you start your own professional Facebook page or right. Instagram or whatever that is? And I always just wanted to to blend it because realistically, I am, I'm Carrie, I'm a mom, I'm a wife, and then I have an amazing real estate career, and I think it's all meshed in one. So that's always been my rule is, you know, show them 80% of really who you are and then sprinkle in the other stuff. And then our team, we have an amazing social media page, so really just try to share it from there. Right. Well, I mean, in your in your residential clients, because I, I, I believe like kind attracts likes, mm-hmm. and people were looking on there and go, oh, She's a young mom. She's, you know, that's what I'm doing now. This, that kind of thing. And they, th- th- it resonates with them. Sure. And in, in shows that you're a real person. Right. Versus just constant sold, listed, you yeah. know, here I'm showing this house all, all, you know, which is great. It's showing you're doing business. But have you found in, in 10 years, there's really a, there's when you uh, really want long term clients that are referring you? buying and selling maybe in 10 years, maybe they are doing that a couple of times, or, but they're, but they're staying with you is because you have bonds in other ways. You have similar yeah. likes and. Well, I think in general, making sure that you're not treating something like a transaction is the best way to go. You know, real estate is not just pretty pictures and reels on Instagram or, or TikTok videos. It's connecting with those people with your customers, but being a consultant for them. So having that trust. So yes, I think absolutely them seeing pictures of my daughter or my, my new baby and at the beach, they can connect with that, but Mm -hmm. they also absolutely want to be able to trust me and advise them. So I think just meshing that as is the key versus just the same picture over and over and over again of just sold under contract. Because to me, all you're doing with that is just showing kind of dollar signs versus, Hey, how can I help you? Right. With your financial journey. Which is eventually going to lead us into the NAR lawsuit questions, but we'll oh, get there. Okay. We'll get there, though. <laughs> um, as I like to kick off a little bit, just so everyone gets to know you a little bit, mm-hmm. where are you from? Jacksonville, Florida. You are? Yes. Where'd you go to high school? So I'm from the beach, born and raised in Jacksonville Beach, and then I moved to Mandarin for high school. So I went to Mandarin High School, and then after I graduated, I actually went to Gainesville for a few years, came back and graduated from UNF, and then bounced around a a few different states, Mm -hmm. and then landed back here. Chasing jobs or chase a, a so, man dragging you around somewhere? No, no, no. <laughs> so I went to, I moved to Colorado for a year and it was incredible. I have a PR degree. Just, just for experience or? That to... was because of a relationship. Okay. But I went there, I worked for a financial firm and I loved it. I was doing huge events and absolutely loved it. But just, I missed, I missed Florida. I missed the water. I missed my family. I knew that I wanted to set roots. So I came back, actually moved to Winter Park, Florida and started mm-hmm. working in commercial real estate. And that's where I I did the leap from PR, doing huge events, working in the financial industry to commercial. And I fell in love with commercial real estate. But I was on the operations side. I was the right. director of operations for a little boutique firm. 
And I knew that I had fallen in love with real estate, but I was really leaning towards the residential side and completely wet behind the ears, had no idea. I always tell people that I am one of those that I did get into real estate because I thought, wow, there's going to be a flexible schedule and <laughs> it would be great to talk to people. And, and, you know, my first year in, I knew right away, wow, this is completely different than what I thought, but right. wow, am I in love with this. So, so well, you go to, you go to the transition from doing truly PR to the commercial. Mm -hmm. Was it just a job opportunity at the time? And yeah. It was, okay. yeah, it was a job opportunity. They were looking for someone and they loved my resume, even though it was a, it was PR and event planning for this, this large company. I had the operational side behind it. So they, you know, took a shot. I was with them for almost two years. And then I made the leap back to Jacksonville. Um, and that's where I found my real estate home with Keller Williams. In 2014. What was you mentioned you liked com the commercial side, mm -hmm. what you were doing there. What was it that you enjoyed the most? With commercial? Yeah. So, and I'm sure you have this conversation when you speak to different agents. Mm. Commercial and real estate are two different monsters. Real estate is completely emotional. Commercial is all numbers. And mm -hmm. so it was exciting to see these massive deals put together from like a land development side or large buildings. We did a landlord rep. So we worked with landlords, essentially like a listing. You had a, you had a listing, which was an entire shopping center. And then we had agents like buyer agents, but they're called tenant rep and they would find tenants. And it was just exciting to, to say, right. okay, we have three units available. Let's go look at these, these new Tens businesses thousands of square feet yeah yeah and just pairing those new businesses um like mm -hmm. jeremiah's italian ice that was one of our first clients back in 2014 and he had just started so it was just really that i loved that part of it mm -hmm. but there was something that was just making me want to go towards residential so when i moved back to jacksonville i interviewed every brokerage you could possibly think of and landed at keller williams well, it's interesting. Uh, you in one of the questions I always ask, if you've listened to any amount, is that initial brokerage choice? Because I think mm -hmm. it it can break someone. Yeah, I mean, there's uh, we know the amount of people that fall out in the first twenty four months in yeah. real estate, and it could be it could be their choice in brokerage and understanding yeah. that when you were what kind of um, uh, I don't know if you had talked to others or, or just did enough questions of those yeah. brokerages evolving yourself on what you should ask as you went from one to the other to find out finally something that clicked with Keller Williams. Yeah. What, tell had, us about that experience. I had my, I think it was like top, my top three questions. And I knew right off the bat, I had a friend and a mentor who had been in residential for about 10 years. And she said, you need to make sure you find the right place because you don't want to just be the agent that just bounces around from brokerage to brokerage. And I've mm -hmm. seen that so often. So for me, it was the culture, being able to walk into somewhere and have that welcoming committee and the training and the financial part of it. So the cap and what the brokerage fees are. It's not rocket science. It was really just trying to figure out what, right. what gave me the warm and fuzzies, but also would make my, my wallet feel great. What I found here, well, we know Keller Williams in, in town is pretty yeah. stout with the different, even with the different franchises. Some are larger than others, but if I went back and looked at the roster of everyone I've had on, the top producers, Keller Williams is definitely has. Pro I've probably had more Keller Williams people on than any others. Yeah. There are. Do you think too many people are looking at? the splits and so forth because Keller Williams is providing mm -hmm. or trying to provide a lot of value. I know people have left Keller Williams and tried to go other places, but you know, because I think they are looking at probably the third or fourth thing they should be looking at. And that's the splits, yeah. right? Yeah. What, are, what, are, what is the value? I mean, over the years, what are you know, looking at other people that have come and gone out of there, uh, knowing what you know, because you've stayed there the whole time, the value that you've continued to see from, from Keller Williams. I think that and you nailed it when you said that people are looking at the percentages, which I understand. Mm -hmm. I think that that's a very nearsighted way of looking at it because if you're looking at, if you're just looking at a commission check, first off, that's commission breath, right? Mm -hmm. What does, what does your brokerage provide for you? If you're not trained properly and if you're just thrown into the wolves, okay, you're, you hung your license, now go, right. which I know there are a lot of brokerages that are like that. They're flat fee or whatever that is, or they, they say that they're, they don't charge a percentage, but then it's actually wrapped up in. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's, you know, you're you're having these people that take a, a, a week-long course, right, in real estate or an online course. 
the the barrier of entry, unfortunately, isn't really that high. And I'm going to say that. And it, it, it's just because you, you get your license. And then if you don't go to the right brokerage, you they literally just go, okay, here's a contract, go. And it's scary. And I think that's why a lot of people do end up going to coming back to Keller Williams or going to a different brokerage that even though there is a larger maybe cap that's sticking out, but there's lots of training and you have that relationship with your broker. It's just, it's worth it in the long run at the end of the day. Well, because there, like I said, there's, there's so many top agents too at Keller Williams. How have you found that synergy, if we'll use that word, (laughs) just being around as every personal development book we read, right? It always says it's the five people you surround yourself sure. with. To be able to walk in that office or whether you're at your the social events or different things that Keller's doing internally that you guys are at, to be around, hey, these are all people that are striving like me. They're looking for the next deal. They're, you know, they're trying out different marketing things to move the needle, Mm -hmm. to be around people like that. I think that, again, well, I always say when you walk into a brokerage and if there's a ton of agents there, that's not actually that great because they should be out on appointments. But what's great, one thing that's really great about- Sometimes it's just the perception. (laughs) The perception. (laughs) There's no ivory towers. There's, again, at the end of the day, it's being able to- trust your your broker that they have your back that you can go to them with any questions that you have peers and colleagues that are like-minded like you and just feeling comfortable and i i we work with a lot of agents we're very listing heavy and we see a lot of agents on the other side that i end up coaching through or having conversations with or they've made a huge mistake on a contract that could cost their buyer $10,000. And that's really scary. And so I think finding the right brokerage, making sure that you're trained properly, and then having that high proficiency in what you're doing is is the the way to go. So when you jumped into the retail world, you you did your due diligence, you Mm -hmm. choose Keller Williams. Tell us what it was like for you in in those first 12 months. Did it, did it come easy for you be based on your background or just mental mindset altogether? Cause I talking about some of these new agents, some of them really don't even know what to do the first day. They're like, okay, real estate let's in. They're hoping they walk into that brokerage and that brokerage is going to hopefully hold them by the hands and get them, get them going. What, what was your first 12 months like? Well, for me, I knew right away that I wanted to find a team to be a part of. And so I did my research. I interviewed with different teams. And what that looks like is you can either be a single agent or on a team. And I wanted to be a part of a team because I wanted to have that extra layer of training, marketing, whatever that looks like. And so I joined a team and the person's team that I joined now we're partners and we've, it's been, I think eight years or nine years, but the first Wow, nine years. Yeah. The first 12 months I did, I did really well. And it's because I was consistent because of the training with Keller Williams, but also with the, the camaraderie with the team and, and just going to the office every day, treating it like a real estate business. I always tell people, I have people reach out to me still every week. Hey, I'm thinking about getting my real estate license. And I'm like, okay, well let's talk about why. And, you know, if you treat it like a business, if you wake up every single day and you, you know, don't just wait for something to happen to you, you can be very, very successful, but it takes a lot of hard work. Imagine you explain to them the way you committed yourself mm-hmm. to come in the morning. Because I think a lot of, uh, there's no doubt if we, if we look at some of the, we want to call them failures, just people have dropped out. They didn't have that mindset like you had. They didn't, you Keller Williams said, okay, you want to hear that you're on this team. We meet every morning at nine o'clock and we have a you know sales huddle or whatever. Or I know there's a lot of successful teams that literally lean on each other that nine to 11, they're making those sales calls. Yeah. Well, that's what they're going to do. Get those sales calls out of the day, out of the way first thing in the morning, eat the frog, right? Mm-hmm. And then they go on. Uh, how much was that part of your success to, to, to just buy in? Bl- almost, I want, I'm going to use the word blindly, but just to yeah, buy in into it, first. drink the Kool-Aid a little bit. I think, well, and, and just to be really honest, because now it has been, it'll be in July, it'll be 10 years with Keller Williams. I think that for me, my career absolutely started that way. What it has evolved into looks completely different right. because, again, started off as a smaller team and then became really large expansion team and then back down to um, a small team, and we're so happy about that. So our, our daily routine looks totally different than what it did 10 years ago. But starting off, I woke up every morning. I went to the office. I did my lead gen every single morning from 9 to 11. We had team huddles. It was the grind. We were making it, – it was incredible because it, it trained me – 
to build that foundation to get my real estate career started. Um, but now it has evolved in a sense that, you know, we have the machine that, that's rolling. So myself, my partner, and our agent, we all essentially work from home virtually mm-hmm. a little bit and pop into the office when we when we need to. But we're really just rocking and rolling all over town. And so it's, it's really evolved in the last 10 years. Yeah, I mean, well, obviously you're 10 years, 10 years in, 57 transactions last year. I'm, I'm sure you didn't go from three transactions the year before. Mm-hmm. You've had some success now and the reputation. But how important it is for those new agents to get some of those reps and they hopefully get them early. Yeah, you have to. And I think one of the things is when we were, um, like I said, we were an expansion team at one point. So we were in uh, Jacksonville and then three other markets. Mm -hmm. I was interviewing a hundred people a year. And, and one of the main red flags that I saw was that they, we call them brokerage hoppers and they literally would just go from brokerage, brokerage, brokerage. And it's not that that's awful. It's just that they, they were looking for something. And so they, there's always a decision that you make, right? So you can go to the right or the left and that first brokerage that you choose and the people that you surround yourself with is extremely important because it can set the tone for your entire career. hundred percent. So you saw those, you're, you're interviewing these people to possibly bring them on your team. What, mm-hmm. what I mean, I, I assume you addressed that. Why are you hopping every one or yeah, two Yeah, I always just ask the question of, it's like anything. I think if any industry that you're in, if you see someone that's been at 10 different companies in mm-hmm. a few years, why, what's the why behind that? So I would always just ask the question of why. And it was always typically leads. Um, everyone wants leads. And that's typically why people will go to, will jump to different brokers, leads or commission splits. So... I would just handle it case by case. I would guess that a lot of these, a lot of these, a lot of agents who possibly run into that, or like I said, just fall out of the business, follow what someone else, you know, their their girlfriend or whatever. Someone said, "Oh, you need, you should go over there." Without, I think Caitlin Doherty said it the best from DJ and Lindsay when she was on. She thinks people do it because they think the brokerage is going to solve whatever challenges they yeah. are personally having mm-hmm. versus them understanding the challenges that they're having and matching it with a brokerage that's going to help them overcome that. They're, right. they're jumping into a brokerage and saying, and, and, and not really truly understanding thyself right. first right. before understanding and then what that brokerage is going to bring to them. It's like a relationship. Yeah. It's like when you're dating someone, it's the people who keep hopping and bouncing. It's, <laughs> the, it's the same concept. You're, it's, you need to work on yourself and figure out what's going on before you can really settle down. And, and that's right. what it is. Yeah. It, this is just uh, if, uh, during the, any, any of the last 10 years, have you worked with a coach or had a, a yeah. mentor and so yeah. t- tell us why you, what, what brought you to a point of, Hey, I, I think I need to move to a coach. I think it was during our expansion era and with Keller Williams expansion teams were taking off and I was at a a point where I had 10 agents who I essentially was leading and trying to help and coach them and what's the best way you can't coach other people if you're not being coached is what I always think you should always better yourself if it's a mentor or whatever that looks like so yeah I had coaches for about four or five years Mm -hmm. and I would take a little bit from this coach and then when I felt like I had hit a little bit of a ceiling I would take a little bit of a breather and then maybe find someone else but I've always had mentors in my life and and coaches and I think it's great because you're well you're running your own business Mm -hmm. you're trying to make your own sales and then you're trying to lead these other people and it's really hard at the end of the day when you're doing all that to try to stay in front of them right so i mean i assume that coach was also an aid to try to stay out in front of the team you're leading right yeah right absolutely Yeah. yeah i think with we all are looking for a little bit of of guidance or soundboard, right? But when it comes to accountability and making sure you want to hit your goals, that's um, that's one of the things that Keller Williams is huge about is hitting what is what do your goals look like? What is your why? I was huge into teaching one, three, five classes, which is like your one goal, your three priorities, and your five strategies. Mm-hmm. So I just think having anyone that you can bounce ideas off of and they can hold you accountable is always great. What do you think are the, are the challenges of, of some of these agents that especially – Probably maybe came in in 2019, mm-hmm. 2020, as fast as you could stick a sign in the in the yard. Yeah. People, you, buyers were not a problem to find on every street corner. You know, the, the, well, the demand is still reasonably high. But now that there's, we've got some other curveballs in, in the mix, interest rates, inventory, you know, is, is minimal. 
what do you think their cha- their challenges with right now that you're seeing around the around the office? I'm using the ter- phrase around the office. I know right. you're not in I'll the office, say all of but Florida. some of these agents that maybe you're talking like you're talking to on the phone that it was so easy. Now they're having negotiation. Yeah. And I think I think post COVID, I think it set really unrealistic expectations of what the market is. Like you said, you would put a sign in the yard and you would have 25 offers. Mm-hmm. That was happening too. We had so many agents that joined just that that first year and their sales were crazy and it looked amazing it's very unrealistic expectations and what it did is it didn't the reason why I do think that I have been successful is I had to work really really hard and I had to fall a lot Mm -hmm. in those first few years and I had to lose out on negotiations and things like that it teaches you when you're just handed everything it doesn't really it doesn't really sit the same so I think that now what's happening is they have a little bit of false expectations. They have to have harder conversations with with buyers and sellers. And we always call ourselves consultants, right? We want to consult with you on what your real estate journey is, on what your real estate um, goals are. And a lot of agents that started in 2019, 2020, they didn't really have to have those consultations and those hard conversations. It was just, hey, let me show you a house. Let's get you under contract, whatever that looks like. Right. And I think if you are a true consultant, I think that you're going to last a lot longer. And I think that what's happening with, and I know you said you're going to talk about it, but what's happening with all of the, the NAR stuff. Um, I was, that was gonna, <laughs> I was going to lead right into that next question. Cause this is yeah, leading right into it. It's, yeah. It's there's two things. First off, you set yourself apart as, as a real estate consultant, right? Real estate agent. There are agents that got their license and they, they show houses for maybe all the wrong reasons, and they have a credit card, so they buy leads, right? And I'm not knocking that completely because we have absolutely had we've been internet lead heavy before, mm-hmm. but right now we we really we have a rule that we like to follow where we work with friends and institutions, and we work with friends because they trust us, they know our expertise, our experience, and then institutions, it's more of either running acquisitions for an institution or working with regional builders. Mm. With that, uh, the regular agent who, maybe they've only been in the industry for six months or two months or whatever it is, they think, well, I need leads. So they swipe their credit card, and then they now are that agent on the other line when Zillow calls, right? Mm -hmm. When Zillow is there and, and a buyer wants to see a house. What's happened over the past few years is that the consumer gets a phone call from an agent that they think knows about the house. And what happens is, is they, they don't, they just, they've, they've bought that lead. So the proficiency and the expertise has dwindled down and the consumer I think has caught on to that. And Mm -hmm. with all of this, with this NAR settlement, I think that the agents that are proficient in in the real estate industry and that know what they're doing i think they can reap the benefits and i think it is going to weed out a lot of agents that maybe don't have the foundation that they need Mm -hmm. that makes sense well just two things to drill down Mm -hmm. i don't know we're going to find out eventually i don't know in months years are is the general public paying attention i think that they are and i think that they are going to start reading the headlines even more. Mm -hmm. You know, I've been on a few appointments just last week and every single appointment they've asked me about. Oh, Oh, interesting. And they are friends. They're friends and they're, they're my customers. And I think that sellers are paying attention and I think that we, we want them to pay attention. I think the difference is, is that the headlines say one thing and there's a lot there, there is a little mixed information. Agents need to be armed and ready to, to be able to explain what all this means, if you don't understand what's happening and you can't explain it, you're, that seller is not going to feel, it's not going to have the warm and fuzzies for you. And it's right. going to trust you. Yeah, if they're, not, if they're not a direct referral or friend, you right. could lose some credibility right. there. So, what, well, these were, what, what kind of question were you asked? And then how are you addressing it? Right. And so if you can give us a real life question, scenario here. One of the questions was, hey, we heard that the commission is now negotiable. And then I went into, well, 
in reality, the commission has always been negotiable. And on a listing agreement, it says 3% or 2% or 2.5% to the listing agent and then the selling agent. And I just explained, like I always do, that this co-op is going to the buyer's agent for this reason. And I think the the, the biggest part that a lot of people aren't understanding is that co-op, that's an incentive for mm-hmm. that agent to bring that buyer. If you look at any other sales industry, if it's medical device sales or if it's tech, there's always incentives. There's always incentive programs. And in those industries, it's not looked down, it's not looked down upon. But for some reason in the real estate industry, it's looked down upon. But any product that has an incentive, like a co-op, is of course going to have more people knocking on the door or picking up the phone and saying, I want to see that house. So I think that you just have to be able to articulate what it means, the why behind it. You just it. made me think of all these affiliate links right. that we've got out there. They want everyone to have their affiliate links in Google or, right. or Amazon or whatever, you know, because you're posting so much social media, have mm-hmm. an affiliate link, they click on it, mm-hmm. that person's getting a little commission. And obviously this, the, they've already based it into the sales price right. to pay somebody whatever that amount is. And I, I was listening to, I, I there was a, you know, uh, going in and, and because I've, talked about it, gone on YouTube and watched, get get everyone's opinion on it type of angle. But this one reel that this guy did is the seller, the buyer's always been paying for it. It's right. in the purchase price. Mm-hmm. They already, uh, it's, that's just been the accepted understanding, uh, at least from the real estate agents that uh, when they break it down and why the how it all works, right. they understood it. But how we pass that information or right. educated the consumer. It's just why setting that's, expectations. Yeah. And again, I think this is another example of we as an industry, we haven't really done a great job in policing what that looks like because of the saturation of agents in, we'll just say Northeast Florida, because it is oversaturated, it's the agents haven't really set the right expectations with those sellers. And if they, I had a conversation last week and and she completely understood because I've sold multiple houses for her. And she Mm -hmm. was like, right, well, you've always told me that. And I said, exactly. It's not that it's not that the, the commission isn't negotiable and that the, that the buyer's agent shouldn't get the commission is that it's always been a part of the listing commission and it's paid by, by the brokerage. So I think mm-hmm. it's just setting the right expectations. Yeah. Also, yeah. Always. Well, and I think, uh, I think you would agree that the, the, the 6% has been out there because that's what the market will bear. Right. If the market wouldn't bear, and, and if you talk to agents around the country, I'm sure some of them might be at five, some of them might be at seven or eight, yeah. depending on what price point they're selling. And, right. and that it may, I think, do you think that because of the HGTVs, the Bravos, and that sort of thing, and then there's some agents they're posting on social media, mm-hmm. maybe it's their lifestyle, and and people look at it and go, oh wow, they they may they're right. looking at they're only seeing the the end result, they're not seeing that iceberg that's under the water part, right? And what you're actually I think doing. That's a, a- point that you just brought up is I think one of the biggest um, issues is a guy posts a picture of himself sitting on a Ferrari, right? Mm -hmm. He may not even own the Ferrari, but he thinks that that's going to get him likes and customers. One, that's all that does is show the customer that really all you care about is money. And I think that, I do think that in the last, especially 10 years, especially five, that social media has taken a new game in terms of what the real estate agent looks like. And again, you know, reels and pointing to boxes and things like that and doing dances, it's it's not really showing the consumer that they can trust you with, with maybe the largest sale of their life or purchase of mm-hmm. their life. So I think, again, I think that this settlement is going to cause a lot of chaos, but I think with chaos, there's there's three parts to it. There's, okay, this is happening. Okay, now we're in it. What are we going to do? And then coming to terms with it. And I think right now we are in the, okay, we know this is happening. We're trying to figure it out. And then chaos is going to happen. But with that chaos, Mm -hmm. chaos is a ladder. Okay. But with that chaos, we are going to find out that a lot of agents are going to leave the industry. And that's going to have, it's going to be great for the agents that are proficient and that stay around and they will be able to reap the benefits. Right. I think uh, if you agree or disagree, I th- you think we should leverage social media. We like to show some of the glamour mm-hmm. stuff, but I'm, I'm sure you have stories where you've gone in the listings and you've had to help move furniture. Yeah. You've had to help clean up. There's you a know, lot of some non, nasty non things. glamorous parts to real estate. Yeah. And a lot of people do think it's all the HGTV and 
social media in general is just a highlight reel of someone's life, whatever that is. <laughs> yeah. And I think that, again, a lot of people think that agents might be overpaid. And I'm going to say this, and it may not make a lot of agents happy, but some agents sh- are extremely overpaid if they showed one house and they didn't really consult that person at all. It's about consulting them and advising them and talking about what their actual financial goals are. But I think the consumer, I think this is going to weed out a lot of agents that it's not that they're, uh, that they should have never been in the industry, but maybe it's just not the right time for them or it's, it's just, it's going to shift the industry completely. Well, with the number of agents that I've had on and and when just listening to you talking about having the conversation and and I can list off if I sat here and looked at everyone's face and ran through mm-hmm. the list. I think of Carrie Carpenter was mm-hmm. as number one, just really because we went in depth with it mm-hmm. in creating that relationship from day one or mm-hmm. Sophie Gordon. She that's like her marketing. Her mindset is like creating these long because that's the only way you're going to stay in it long term or if you want to have fast success Mm -hmm. because both of those ladies within a few years because they were doing the right things from the beginning it's those people who and and we've had it in the loan world where you know i've worked a quick a quick in in loan depot in their call center for the first 12 years of my career there's many times people call and say hey i need a loan great boom 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 30 minutes later we're sending out documents and they're e-signing them it's coming back and we're like Boom, yeah. in an hour, we've already basically closed a deal because we were doing a, at one time doing a lot of refinances sure. too. And the, the refinance is something you can do in 30, 40 minutes. Take the information. Yep, you're approved. Send, in, send me your documents. I'm sending these things to sign. And now we're in process. And But with some of those, we also, we don't talk enough about the others where we had to go in and clean their toilets. We had, you <laughs> right. know what I'm saying? To get the house presentable because... Either the people were unable to do it, unwilling to do it, but you want you were earning that sale. Right. You know? Well, and that's just building the relationship. Mm-hmm. And I think there are I think there's a lot of successful agents who build the relationship because they continue to um, cultivate and then they have those repeat um, loyal, loyal fans, mm-hmm. right? Raving fans. Um, exactly. I think that, you know, for us, one of our biggest points is, and I think I, I touched on this a few minutes ago mm-hmm. is we really do. It's our rule is friends and institutions and friends and past clients. It's, they know the expertise and our, the experience. We have that track record of success. And then with institutions, you know, it's, it's a different type of relationship and it's a different type of trust because we have a a local builder that we've partnered with for, I think seven or eight years now. And we've helped them launch over almost a dozen developments. And what that looks like is I can look at a home and go, okay, how am I going to market this home in this community and, and get it sold? When you're working with institutions or builders, you still have, you still need to have that close relationship, but it's really based on trust because we're trying to not just manage how are we going to sell this whole community out, but how are we going to ma- manage sales and keep sales going mm-hmm. so those builders don't have a huge overhead of, of their credit lines. So it's a, it's a higher, different level of trust, but I love that I have that and we have that because that trickles down into I can work with this builder and I can help deploy an entire development of 91 units or 100 units, but then I can also help you sell your your home in Jacksonville Beach. And the knowledge that I take from that, I can help implement. Yeah, well, your diversity. So I'm looking on your social media, mm-hmm. that new development that looks like you've made some recent sales mm-hmm. in on there. Is that is that a condo? What a townhouse is? It's, what are you? It's a townhouse. Okay. So it's a it's a development group, Corner Lot Development and JWB, and Breeze Homes is the the builder that's doing it. And mm-hmm. so we have launched, like I said, over a dozen subdivisions and developments for the builder. And this one is just particularly special. It's in La Villa. It's a 91 unit townhome community. It's the first of its kind, fee simple in over 20 years. So it's just getting a lot of buzz. It's just exciting to be able to have residents purchase in downtown Jacksonville. When you're in a group, because you, you can expand into the working with the foreign property bearer, we'll, mm-hmm. you can uh, explain so we, everyone understands your sure. diverse experience. Were you in a pre-planning stage with them, understanding, like helping them what these units could sell for and so Absolutely. forth? Absolutely, yeah. yeah. So when you are running comps, you're not just looking at okay, this is what we can this is what we can sell it for. You have to figure out, you have to be able to gauge how quickly 
inventory can be built based on the builder's timeline. Mm -hmm. Um, So we, we, of course, looked at numbers and said, okay, based on what's in the surrounding areas, here's where we think we can start and here's where we think we can land based on the timeline of the development. This one is going to go till the end of 2025. None of us have a crystal ball, but we have to be able to to keep up with market market stats and market inventory to to try and figure out how we can get each building sold, tier it out for them. So again, they don't have a huge overhead of credit lines. Well, in this particular project too, obviously it was planned before interest rates went up. Right. So adjusting for that, Mm -hmm. having worked for a large builder not that long ago, the cost of materials and so forth changed. Yeah. How did that, how did those conversations go? I imagine you guys had to regroup in one way, shape or form and say, hey, these are costing us this. Yeah. How can we be more efficient yet still get buyers in there before we price them out? So one of the first conversations, it was, I think, two or three years ago, was about this development. And the numbers looked totally different a few years ago. And mm-hmm. I remember one of our first conversations, it was like, I think we're going to start it around this price. Well, then two years goes by, and we all know it can happen. Mm-hmm. We saw what happened with COVID. We saw what happened with cost of lumber, right? right? And so we just are able to, our goal and our strategy with helping any builder is to stay ahead of the market. So we would never want them to say, okay, we're going to price it at this. They have everything priced out. And then all of a sudden there's a huge inflation. We try to stay ahead of it, price it accurately, price it aggressively to really set the tone of what we think the whole development can can sell for. Right. I remember during COVID, one of the things that happened is we, one of the, it was actually a beautiful, uh, I would say, mistake. We had a digital transformation because of COVID. We were able to create an entire virtual experience with our builder. Site agents couldn't be on site. I mean, you you remember everything mm, changed, yeah. right? So with that, we created this digital transformation where it was a one-stop shop, how you submitted offers, how you saw the property. Um, with that being said, we were doing a lot of pre-sales during that time. But what happened is, and a lot of builders, what happened is they got caught with, um, not caught, that's the wrong word, but in, in a position where they were under contract for a certain amount, and right. then all of a sudden lumber went up. 300 percent so then we had to go back to the consumer and say hey so sorry but your contract is actually up fifty seven thousand one of the the things i love about the builder that we partner with is they were like we don't want to be in that position anymore we're not going to really do the the pre-sales it's more we're going to release a building and then we know the price we're looking at they're looking at the bottom line number now we know where we can land yeah yeah, no, the, the builder I was working, they had to actually go to the spec homes because mm-hmm. it, yeah, it, it's a bad, it's a bad consumer experience. Yeah. And, and even though it's reality of life and they have no control over the cost of that lumber, yeah. the consumer doesn't care. Well, they got a contract for that price. They don't understand really what's all going in right. to that and trying to, you know, predicting the interest rates and so forth. They're trying to predict months and months in advance, sure. if not further, of what money's going to cost mm-hmm. and, and, and balancing that out. The, the question that was coming to my mind there, with this diverse experience, because the average agent is not in these conversations that you're having mm-hmm. and, and working these out. How has that experience helped you with confidence, explaining to just your, your average residential single family home buyer mm-hmm. uh, in, in whether it's doing a listing presentation or a buyer consultation? I think that, and again, and the 10 years I've been doing this, I feel like it's been 20 or 30 because <laughs> I have had, I have worn so many different hats and I've had, I've been thrown in so many different situations which I'm so thankful for because it's allowed me to really feel, have conviction behind the conversations that I'm having. So I can, going to one of my builder meetings and and talking about, we're going to launch this next development. What are we looking to do? What's the pricing? It keeps me, it keeps me completely honed in on what's happening just in the builder community within Northeast Florida. So when I'm coming back and talking to maybe a traditional buyer who wants to buy new construction from another builder, I know I, I have my my thumb on the pulse, right? So mm-hmm. I understand a little bit more about what that looks like from the developmental side. And then just from a financial conversation, we are, the negotiations that we're doing and the incentives that are constantly, you know, going up and down, it just, 
it, it opens your eyes more to a creative negotiation negotiation mm-hmm. art versus just let's offer this. It's really a numbers game. And at the end of the day, yes, we're building relationships, but people don't want a best friend, right? They want to like you and they mm-hmm. want to be able to be in the room with you, but they're looking for real advice and they are looking for you to almost guide them. And some of the, the toughest when they're making a decision there's been so many times where like, what would you do? And I have to have conviction behind what I'm saying. Right. Because it's there's hundreds of thousands of dollars on the line. Well, I, I because my wife's an agent, so I've been listening to these conversations mm-hmm. going on. And in the negotiations back and forth, and sometimes she'll shoot me what's going on just to get my angle on, right. especially if there's finances involved. You know, have you seen since this post COVID really in the interest rates where they're at, but maybe the last 12 months, there's a, I know every loan right now has extra puzzle pieces to it. Mm-hmm. I believe from what I'm seeing is every purchase or sale has extra puzzle pieces Absolutely. to it. Everyone has their, the, the sellers, they're building a home, but it's not quite ready, but they're trying to, they need to sell this home before mm-hmm. that's ready and close yeah. on that other one. And so it's the builders are never on time. So that you need to do a rent back yeah. or, you know, there's all these moving pieces going on and it's involved in a negotiation. And like I said, that, that creativity and how do you, how do you sell not only your customers on in the negotiation that, hey, this is the way I would go because Mm -hmm. you have to also, when you're presenting it to the other agent saying, hey, this is what we need because, and having that knowledge and be able to, um, you know, explain it out to give them ammunition for them to sell it versus just saying, hey, we need this. Right. Go, f- go figure it out. Right. I yeah. think that I've actually, I've dealt with a lot of agents that are like that on the other end. Mm-hmm. And I think at the end of the day, we are here to work together. Well, first off, we're a transaction broker, right? Mm-hmm. So I think at the end of the day, it's how can we make this deal work? How can we get it together? One of my first uh, conversations with an agent on either side is always, hey, I want to be fully transparent and open. Let's see if we can make this work. So I'm going to ask one or two questions right off the bat. And if if it's no, then let's just move on from it. But it's not its not negotiating just to negotiate. I've met those agents too where it's, come on, <laughs> you're just trying to wheel and deal $1,000. Um, it's, it's how can we make this a win-win for the buyer and the seller, right. right? How do we make it where the seller walks away with, wow, I feel really great about this. I don't feel like my, I, I feel like I'm walking away with the equity that I want, right? And then how does the buyer get into that situation not having buyer's remorse the next day? Right. And I think that, as a, as a consultant, when you're talking to someone about their real estate goals, you know right away if someone's comfortable with doing an, ex- or an escalation clause, an appraisal gap, or if a seller is willing to do a post-occupancy. So right off the bat, I think that if you don't know the creative tools to use as an agent, you're just doing your customer a, a disservice. Escalation clauses, appraisal gaps, post-occupancy, as-is, repair requests, it, those all seem like very common, but if you don't understand how to navigate them, you can get yourself in a little bit of trouble. Explain the navigation in, in from your side, because I, I assume a lot of the agents that are listening are, you know, trying to, they're hearing what you're saying. They might be brand new and, and really ab- taking a lot in. Some are just going to find one thing in here that they're going to take that you said and mm-hmm. whatever and implement in their business. Um, listings, listers last, right? That's mm-hmm. the, fr- that's really, the obvious. we're getting a little more inventory right now. Listings are out there. Having that when you go in to have that discussion with that seller Mm -hmm. about their home, preparing them knowing that based on your evaluation of the home, which maybe you did a pre-listing inspection, so maybe no, oh, hey, when the hot water heater needs to be replaced or whatever, but preparing them for that negotiation that wherever it takes us so that when that ping pong match is over, Mm -hmm. they do feel like, Hey, I know we dropped the price a little bit, but I still feel great. How do you how do you prep them for that expectation to hopefully have that feeling? I think um, any conversation you're having with um, a seller or a buyer, but we'll start with a seller, is you go in and 
you absolutely want to do a, a pre-listing inspection or not. You don't have to buy an inspection, but you have to be able to know exactly the, the age and the functionality of every major system. Mm-hmm. You have to have those big reality checks of, hey, I know that you have X, Y, and Z, but your roof is 2006. So you're already setting those expectations and then going into this is what buyers can bring us. So if we list your house for 600000 these are probably the options that we're probably going to get. And I've gotten to a point where even before we list it, I can hone in on where I believe the market is based on the data, right? Days on market, recently sold and active. So what the, what the competition is. And I give them three scenarios before we even go live of here's a scenario one at list price with a possible credit of this because your roof is 20 years old. So let's go ahead and throw in this credit. I give them three solutions right off the bat so and just say hey these are possible scenarios that we might see so when they maybe get one of those scenarios they don't feel blindsided you almost put yourself in the buyer's shoes well it's more of putting myself in the shoes of because of how many contracts i've seen and how many houses i've seen sold on either end I know what's probably going to happen before it comes. And it's not, it's not the crystal ball effect. I wish I had that. (laughs) It's more of just being really proactive about almost talking about what's our worst case scenario. Right. And then reeling it in. Well, I was just thinking if you were representing the buyer Mm -hmm. and knowing what you know, as the, as the listing agent, Hey, the hot water heater's old, the roof is 2006. This is how I would come in and start this negotiation. I flip it a little bit and say, I always want the other, the seller or the buyer to put themselves in the other person's shoes. So right. it's not really me per se. It's, hey, think about if you were a, a first time home buyer. And a lot of the sellers that I do work with, I sold them their home. So mm-hmm. I say, hey, Joe, remember when we bought this home four years ago and we did X, Y, and Z? I have to, I, it's just a reality check. Of, yeah. Hey, what's our end goal? I'm going to try to get you the most amount of money, but it has to be realistic. So what's our end goal? Right. Well, because you've already, the trust the, and, and the credibility is there to have those conversations with them mm-hmm. and, and, to, and, and to be real with them. I, I think you would agree a lot of, yeah, the, if they get the listing, they go, oh, great. All right, I'll put the sign in yeah. tomorrow. I've heard uh, stories where they're already ordering pictures and the agent hadn't even walked by in the house and the house is a mess. Yeah. And you, now yeah. You're, you're ordering pictures <laughs> to come over? What, oh. Slow down a little bit. Yeah, <laughs> you know? and, and I think that's, again, with, with this NAR settlement, mm-hmm. I think that, it's going to cause a lot of chaos, but I think it's it's going to be great for the agents who are actually treating this as a consulting gig and really honing in on how to help. When people. you say chaos, mm-hmm. do you mean more, more of a mental chaos? Yeah, I don't think it's going to be people running around screaming. I think, <laughs> it's, um, I think it's the chaos of one agents who have been doing this maybe since COVID and Mm -hmm. things are getting a little harder, they're probably, you know, sweating a little bit because they're thinking, how am I going to provide for my family? Or, Mm -hmm. well, I'm, I'm used to doing X amount of deals and I'm used to collecting uh, this check. If they don't understand how to navigate that with a buyer broker agreement or navigate that with uh, explaining it to sellers, we're probably going to see a lot of those agents leave mm-hmm. and i think that's that's the chaos and i think on the seller side the chaos is them maybe not understanding fully what's actually happening and if they don't have the right agent or consultant in front of them that can explain it to them it's not going to make them feel very great and i think again as long as we are just open and transparent and we say hey the commission, it's its always been this way. It can be negotiable. We're going to do a buyer broker agreement. I think as long as we set the right expectations, everything's going to be fine. So uh, I imagine you're getting internal memos in Keller. Mm-hmm. What kind of tone, what kind of mindset are they trying to keep everyone in right now? Because I, I imagine it's already starting to come out as obviously some trainings, but mm-hmm. they're going to really make a focus on creating this presentation and being more, however, role-playing in, in this for some of these agents, some is going to come easy for us, some are going to have to work at it. Well, honestly, one of the, the things that we've always done, my partner and I with our team and with Keller Williams, we've always 
done by our broker agreement. So Mm. it's nothing new to us. Again, we've always treated this like a business. We've treated ourselves like consultants. So anytime I work with a buyer that's a friend or whatever that looks like, we're doing a full consultation and we're saying, these are the reasons why you need an agent. These are the reasons why I'm here for you. This is a handshake on paper saying, I'm I'm your guy, I'm your person, and I'm going to be here to help you. If you don't have that buyer broker agreement, I've seen it a thousand times where an agent shows a buyer 25 houses and then they're out of town that weekend and the buyer goes to an open house and goes under contract because the buyer didn't really understand. Mm-hmm. And again, it's it can go either way. It's the agent's fault for not really explaining it. And it's also not having something signed. If you're not treating yourself like a professional, why is someone else going to treat you like a professional? For the consumers that might be listening, Mm -hmm. or maybe we cut a reel out of this, how should, in your way, how... How do you introduce that we're going... You're going to get them to sign this buyer broker agreement? What is what is the steps that you lead in your presentation, next consultation process that leads you to getting that signed? So I think with any, I treat it like a profession. And I, when I'm talking to any agent and I'm trying to help them or coach them, it's mm-hmm. if you called an attorney, right, you would set up a meeting and you would go to that attorney's office, right? And they would go over the, the plan of action, right? That's the same as real estate agents. We are consultants. So we're going to set up an appointment. We're going to talk. We're going to consult on what your buyer needs are. And then we're going to go over what this looks like from day one of setting up listings to how I'm going to get you under contract. You Mm -hmm. have to set the expectation and outline, hey, I want to be able to show you what don't assume they is. know what right. you're going to be doing. Don't assume that they know. Assume, you know, even if they're not a first-time home buyer, even if they sold a home 10 years ago, I'm sorry, bought a home 10 years ago, so much has changed. So they want a professional, they want a consultant. So they want to be able to know exactly what are they in for, right? Mm-hmm. And then you tell them, this is what we're seeing. If there's a house that doesn't have, if there's a first, if there's a uh, for sale by owner, let's say on Zillow, and you're interested in it, and it doesn't say that there's a co-op, let me worry about that. That's not your job. Mm-hmm. That's that's why I'm here. Don't worry about that. I'm going to handle that with the agent and with the seller. And I think that it's just having conviction behind it. Something that I wanted to touch base on and talking about the builders and the institutions is, mm-hmm. you know, we were talking about chaos a little bit. I I truly believe that this is a kind of a, a door opening more for builders and institutions because sellers don't really know which way they want to go and they don't know possibly if they want to offer those co-ops and things like that while we're trying to figure everything out i think this is a a great time for those builders to keep offering those amazing incentives right because like i said before any sales industry that has an incentive and for that product, you're going to get more people in the door. So mm-hmm. it's just, I think, a great time for builders to keep throwing out those incentives and those co-ops because it's going to show that the it's going to show the buyer and the consumer that the agent is still valued. Well, let's flip it over since you brought up the that those incentives. Mm-hmm. You got a listing on obviously an existing home. Mm-hmm. How are you strategizing with the lister or with the seller mm-hmm. in? To, compete with a lot of new construction because wouldn't you say the new construction is your primary competitor well and right now the number one question i still get asked every day is what are interest rates Mm -hmm. and you know what one of the the main incentives years ago was always just closing costs so that was one of the number one conversations bullet points i would talk with the seller is we can list your house for six hundred thousand. here's some scenarios that might come into play the buyer may ask for 3% closing cost, right? So that was one of the snares I was talking about. Now it's, hey, to make sure we're competing with these builders who are buying down the rate, we need to throw in, if you're comfortable with it, let's, it doesn't have to be closing costs, let's throw in $10,000 towards a rate rate buy down. And so that's become the new new normal. So you're trying to get them to do it up front versus... Two weeks on the out there. Oh, we need to drop I price. I think it definitely or, depends on the on the situation. Right. But again, every scenario, it's hey, if we come to a place where you 
are wanting to reduce the price, do a price improvement, we just have to figure out what different incentives are. But the rate buy down is the number one incentive. But I think it just depends on the situation. If a seller mm. needs to move in 45 days because they got a job transfer, then I think we're going to throw in a little bit more bells and whistles. Right. But again, it's just setting expectation. And the rate buy down is the number one competition right now with builders. If you were to make a broad assumption over the greater real estate agents that are out there, mm. is it having these conversations like we're talking, like sitting down, like, hey, here's you've you've because you've gestured several times that you've gone to your buyer or seller and say, hey, this could happen, this can happen, this can happen, A, B, or C, mm -hmm. that these conversations aren't going on enough, right, with the with the agents in in their and who they're representing. Um, I would agree with that. And yeah. I think I think what happens is, and again, it's hard because there's that fine line where we are very listing heavy. So we see a lot of agents on the other end who we have an amazing transaction coordinator, Leslie. She's been with us for almost five years. And these agents are asking her for advice, questions that they should be going to their broker for. Right. And it happens all the time. People, it's, it's mind blowing and it's scary to think that these individuals have someone's finances typically, you know, essentially in their hands. But I think that setting expectations, having the conversations, I think a lot of agents, for some reason, they get the listing, they get really excited, and then they just, you know, want to be the person's best friend, and they want to talk about, I'm going to do this, this, I'm going to make a reel, I'm going to take photos, mm. but they're not having those financial conversations up front. Um, the stuff that can really throw it off the tracks. The stuff that can really throw it off the tracks. And mm. like I said, I like going over worst case scenario just to show them, hey, this could happen, but I'm going to do everything possible to not let that happen. Right. Right. Like I can be, I can be the nicest person in the room, but I can also be a complete bulldog when it comes to getting you what you need and you want. And that's what they want at the end of the day. Right. They want to walk away feeling like they have the money in the bank that they want, that you did, that you earned every penny. And I think that's one of the biggest kind of issues that we have. And with all of this is unfortunately consumer doesn't feel like the agent is worth the money and that's 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 what's happened mm -hmm. and that's because take zillow for instance like i said earlier a lot of agents just buy leads right off the bat and if the consumer keeps getting paired up or matched up with an agent that really doesn't know what's going on with that listing over time they ha keep having bad experience after bad experience they're not going to have trust right. in those agents i want to step back on the just to give some advice out for for new agents because i think you would agree with this and and i think they need to hear it from top producers all the time because i haven't met a top producer who said no i wouldn't spend any time with that but mm -hmm. for these agents that you were just gesturing that are asking your transaction coordinator right. for advice right they need to search out someone early as as a uh, you know, more uh, a mentor. I mean, you'd like to think it's a broker, but some of these Keller Williams is a big organization. It's not a little boutique brokerage with mm -hmm. 15, 20 agents. You're talking hundreds of agents in any one office. Yeah. And to search out that person you can go have lunch with, you can go get a coffee with a uh, type of thing, a top producer that has transactions closed and has been doing a little bit of while that they, you know, that they can become friends and converse with and ask a question that they may be embarrassed to ask their broker, though they shouldn't be. Yeah. The broker doesn't expect you to know everything. They know that they've been doing the business hopefully long enough, yeah. but to, to have those, that conversation of how I should handle this, especially right now with these negotiations Everyone to role play somebody. with somebody to yeah. say, Hey, this is what we're going to come back with. What do you think their response might be to prepare? Cause I think another thing that's probably lacking is they should be playing this like chess and they should know what their next three moves are and right. what the counter moves are going right. to be. I think again, going to the, the right brokerage because the brokerage has to have training, you know, in, in any industry that you're in, you have some sort of, of guide or you know you shadow or, or training whatever that looks like because the the real estate license because you can obtain that pretty quickly um, you have to really find the right brokerage that is going to set you up for success right. um, I can't hone on that enough 
And then in addition to training at your brokerage, you really should find someone that you can, that can mentor you. And again, you don't want to call this person five times a day because they're, they're working as well. It's either finding a team or finding someone that you can just go to, to have those, those, those questions answered. When you were doing your initial, you said you talked to several brokerages before choosing Keller Williams. Did you talk to any of the agents at that time? Or just more or less the broker to, or the recruiter? Oh, to pick their brains? Well, just to, yeah, how is it? Is that, everyone's going to tell me they went to their brokerage. Is a, I've heard 180 mm-hmm. something mm-hmm. of them because of education and technology. Mm-hmm. So we know that's not really what it is. They, they, or at least they maybe talked a good game about the education or they yeah, talked a good I game. Yeah, it's a first date. But, it's a first date. Yeah. So every brokerage that I went to, and I you name them all, I went to all of them. Well, even 10 years ago, half of them didn't exist, to be honest. But but I went to all the big ones. And it was like a first date. Everyone's dressed nice. Everyone's telling you what you want to hear. It's it's courting. Right. And I think at the end of the day, I I had to choose because I personally, I, I wanted to get the warm and fuzzies. A lot of the broker just checked off all the same boxes. Mm-hmm. And there was three that ch- checked off education and things like that. Um, but I, I loved the the culture and just the relationship in general. And you know, I had spoken to multiple agents that were at that brokerage at one point in time. And so that's really what what sealed it for me. So you talked to agents. That that that, yeah. that was the case because the like you said, the brokers are going to be dressed nice and they're going to yeah. tell you all the good things. Yeah. To and, and agents are. Uh, the top agents to me are collaborative. Mm-hmm. They're willing. They're willing to talk to you. I think when in reality you've been in the business long enough. Yeah, you are competition, but your circle of people that you know and this person coming that you don't know, their circle is totally different. Yeah, there's enough market share to go around. Yeah, yeah. To, to share that, change uh, pace here a little bit. I noticed you have an Airbnb. Yeah. Is that mm-hmm. tell us a little bit about that and what is how's that another dimension sure, of, yeah. of actual experience yeah. of running an Airbnb? Yeah. So, yeah, we bought a, a vacation rental in Volana during COVID. So people thought we were crazy. <laughs> uh, one of the best risks ever taken. And it's been great. It's I call it a business in a box. It was already a well running machine who we bought it from. And so, but we manage it ourselves. So it's talking about like occupancy rates, um, what that looks like in terms of like the, the management. That's absolutely a part of, I would say my portfolio. I actually have a, um, a customer right now. She's, um, a, a great friend of mine and I've sold her two or three houses and now she wants to buy a vacation rental. So we're actually mm-hmm. looking at one next week and it's, Hey, I don't know what I'm doing give me all the, the info, the good, the bad, the ugly. Right. And that's where I can come in and I can set you up and go, okay, this is this is a great location. Based on the um, occupancy rate, I think we could do this. I can connect you with this um, property management company and I can really run that performa of what it looks like um, because at the end of the day, it has to be, it has to make sense for the, the return that they're getting. It's a, it's a different animal, mm-hmm. and in some areas, there's an oversaturation. Yeah, we know St. Augustine Beach. Yeah. You're limited. Yeah, you need to know that. Not mm-hmm. just you can't just turn any place into an Airbnb. Right. You have to have that knowledge. There's so many times over the years where you know working with agents where they've come. Oh my God, they want to buy an investment property, and because they don't own their own investment properties. Um, well, not to say that they haven't dabbled it. They think it's like a, a some sort of different animal. Right. But now with the, when Airbnb, I think it's, I don't know, personally, I think it's the, the wave has gone by because some areas are oversaturated yeah. with them. People are just common houses or Airbnb, which I think more people were thinking more of the vacation rental near yeah. the beach. You can walk the beach. Right. But what are some, what is the, some things that people need to, for, one, they need to obviously call someone like yourself right. that's experienced. Mm-hmm. But what are some of the obvious things that they need to consider when looking, say, hey, I want to buy an Airbnb. It's not as simple as yeah, that. Yeah, I think you know? location, location, location mm-hmm. uh, is number one. A house can look great online, but it's all about the numbers. And if the numbers don't work for you, especially if you're getting a mortgage out to, to right. purchase this, you absolutely need to work with a company that can give you what those occupancy rates are, 
what what what's your what's the average occupancy like is it rented out 75 percent of the time like those numbers matter so much and then also what are the carrying costs mm -hmm. is there an hoa what's your overhead is it furnished so there's a whole performa that i go over with them and say okay here's what you can expect again i don't have a crystal ball mm -hmm. but here's what you can expect here's what your mortgage insurance taxes everything would be and here's what we think you can net based on what we think we can get if you if you rate it at this number. So there's just so much that goes right. into it. I, I think having investment properties is incredible. It's just, you have to make sure that you're buying the right one. Otherwise it's not gonna be very great. A lot of people have, have, have asked this question before, but I think it really needs to get out there based on the current market conditions with rates where they're at and so forth. I think it was a little easier when rates were two and 3%, but you get an investment property, obviously you pay a little bit higher interest rate with an investment property, apples to apples versus your primary residence, but that's understood. But to net, pro, you know, have some sort of cash flow off it, mm -hmm. would you right now recommend if someone's in the position, even if it was a, a net zero, cash flow situation to invest yeah i think i get asked that question a lot i think for the last year and a half i think buyers in general have they stopped buying because they wanted the interest rates to go down and i think we've seen that you just need to buy mm -hmm. whatever it is there's different types of loans that you can do which you know mm -hmm. as an investor and i think that if you have the money to do it like just take the risk do it make sure the numbers work but i i'm all about if it's the right one and you can make it work and you can make the mortgage payment and we can make sure that you're even just breaking even or whatever that looks like, I say absolutely do it. Yeah. Because over time, the, the equity is there. We know that yeah. they're going to build equity yeah. in it. And then, you know, the rates do drop. You, you, you refinance it, right. restructure yeah. it in right. any way, um, shape, or form. I would hate to advise anyone on just don't buy right now. And it's not, it's, you know, I always, I always joke around that I convince people not to sell their house all the time because it's, if it doesn't make sense for you, it doesn't make sense. Mm. That's that commission breath. I'd, I've never, I don't have commission breath because I want it to make sense for you. But I would never advise someone just don't do anything with real estate right now because of the market, because the market could change tomorrow. <laughs> right. We have no idea. But back to the Airbnb, mm -hmm. you self-manage it. Mm -hmm. I think people underestimate going in and cleaning mm -hmm. and all those little things that you need to do when people moving out. Yeah. Um, the weekenders, the one or two nighters, you could be cleaning that place multiple times yeah. uh, a week versus obviously I know with our units, we're able to really, my wife focused on getting those people in there for months at a yeah, time. We block it out where I we think we have the minimum of three nights mm -hmm. I, on slow months. We will bring it down to one night because the wear and tear itself is also another part of it to think about, but no, it's a well-oiled machine. It's, mm -hmm. we have a, we have a cleaning team that you gotta have a clean. That's, yeah, it's so important. It's hard to find they, those. Yeah. And our vacation rental is, 35 minutes away, it's 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 a well-oiled machine. And that's right. the thing is, if you want to self-manage, you absolutely can. And But if you want to hire a property management company, they, they're out there too. So I think mm -hmm. it just depends on what you want to do. We self-manage, but we have the team that comes in and does everything. All right. Well, I actually had the, the Women for Women Jacks mm -hmm. on here. Tell us about that. Okay. So Women for Women Jacks is an incredible connecting group. We don't like to use the word networking. We like to say connecting because... I know you've probably been to a million different networking mm -hmm. events and uh, essentially it's a happy hour and everyone just hands out business cards, <laughs> but you don't feel like you walked away with uh, a connection. And so I joined, it'll be almost two years and uh, I fell in love with it. I thought it was a great group of women. It's all different types of um, different industries. A lot of entrepreneurs. We have a lot of uh, financial advisors. We have health industry. It's just everything you could think of. Mm -hmm. Became a part of the board with my event planning background. I wanted to dabble in that. So yeah, I'm a part of this group and it's a, a group, great group of women. We meet once a month and we typically, we like to focus on local business owners. Mm -hmm. And it's funny, we've had a few men say, well, why can't we join? And I'm like, well, it defeats the purpose, but it's what they're there. They're because you can join the council. What's the one at the realtor or women's council, yeah. right? Yeah, men can actually join, right? That. Right, right. <laughs> um, yeah, I have a few colleagues that are in that, um, but no, it's it's more of just local business owners trying to figure out what we want to focus on that month. It's always diverse. So this month, it's it's tomorrow actually, mm -hmm. it's going to be we're focusing on um, finances and then something to do with we like to do either emotional 
health, holistic, whatever it is. So we always try to stick with something that has to do with like your business. We did a panel, which I was on where I talked about investing and and flipping houses and things like Mm -hmm. that. So we always like to have a financial component of it and then maybe go holistic or do, we had billions in in bourbon where we did a bourbon tasting and Mm -hmm. then we talked about financial planning. So you more or less kind of like have a lunch and a guest speaker or panel? It's it's a monthly event and we have food and drinks and sometimes we'll have a panel and sometimes we'll always have a speaker or a panel and then we do some sort of um, like task afterwards. So it's, it's really fun. All right. So um, the last part I have on here and I, cause I think it's so important cause everyone does it differently in mm-hmm. real estate. We'll fi- try to finish up with this. There's prospecting and marketing from mm-hmm. what I'm told. Yep. <laughs> yeah. What is your, what, you know, over 10 years, you've probably evolved. Like I said, initially you went in, you were doing the prospecting calls, nine to 11 sure. type of type of thing. What have, has your marketing campaign looked like today or your prospecting campaign? What are the, the, the foundational things that are just going on? You have maybe mm-hmm. set on auto drive and they're doing, but what does Carrie do for staying top of mind in front of her, uh, because you've mentioned a lot of your clients are friends or these institutions. Mm-hmm. You want to say it's top of mind on them. What are you doing there? What is what does Carrie's marketing look like? So it's so interesting because I feel like everyone does it either exactly the same or totally different. Mm-hmm. I, I think I mentioned this when we first started talking. We've done the whole loud thing at one at one point. We were you know a very loud large team, a lot of like drip campaigns and and just videos and things like that and. Over the years, we've really honed in on the quality of of who we work with and what we're trying to convey. If mm-hmm. it's through social media, if it's through email, things like that. Of course, we do the standard newsletter because we want to stay on top of mind to our database. We do a lot of YouTube videos, but really, it's just um, my social media that I that I sprinkle in here and there. But mm-hmm. it's just it's the YouTube videos doing market analysis and we do our newsletters but other than that it's really just more organic and it's just the relationships with the the builders well you you have these regular things you you say your newsletter whether it's going Mm -hmm. out monthly or whatever Mm -hmm. your crm is is pumping something out yeah i'm sure yeah multiple times a month yeah and then your your crm which is is gotten you like you said you when you you've reached a point you've created enough credibility created enough friends that trust you Mm -hmm. and now you're just reminding them because obviously everyone's not selling a house every right. month or year right. when it comes around but hopefully you're you're staying out there that if they're at a barbecue this weekend and someone says they're looking to buy or sell a home they remember to carry the one that they, they go to yeah it's it really is it's over the years it has become more organic i'm not passing out business cards everywhere mm-hmm. i go it's just everyone real estate is always a topic anywhere you go yeah and it's just it can be a very organic conversation of carrie how's the market doing and it's, I've gotten to a point where I don't even bring it up anymore. It's It gets brought up to me. And I think that just is probably years of experience and, and doing what I've done. And, of course, doing the social media stories and, and of, of the experiences that I have and the happy moments and sometimes the good and the bad and the ugly with flips that we have and mm-hmm. squatters and stuff like that. But it's just it's letting people know that, hey, I'm here. I'm here to advise um, without – Shoving it down their throat. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that makes sense. Well, you enter a social situation, you go over someone in the neighborhood, and there's 20 other couples there. Yeah. You're putting out on your social media your your real estate, what you're doing, and that sort of thing. The common thing to break ice in a conversation to someone who you're not talking to every day mm-hmm. is to say, hey, what's going on in, the, what's going on in real estate? Yeah. Then, boom, the I conversation think being starts. I a resource for, for people, too. Like, the other day, I had a friend text me, past client and friend, and they just they needed help with a with an attorney and it's just being a resource i want to yeah. i want to be that that person for you whatever it is i want to be able to connect you with anyone that you need if it's a financial advisor if it's a cpa if it's a if it's a lawn company if it's whatever that looks like i want to be able to connect you because if you're adding value to someone they're going to see it and I think that's really the key is that you have to be a resource for people. You have to show your value. And it's not – don't have commission breath. Don't drool at the mouth when you when someone says they want to buy or sell a house. Just have a, a conversation with them and say, hey, I'd love to chat with you and see if I can help you. I, I think, you know, you, you bring up a point, and it's been brought up before, but it, I don't know if I, I triggered this thought at the time. But real estate agents are an important part of – the general community going back to the NAR lawsuit, you sure. know, they're, they're sitting there trying to attack agents and saying, you get paid to them. Great agents are an asset 
to the many businesses. Right. Uh, you know, uh, you know, we know that building houses is a huge part of our GDP because there's so many people involved from mm-hmm. building all the different pieces, washer, dryer, whatever. Mm-hmm. And obviously holding a community together when people own homes, they generally want to protect the area that they're around. Right. right? And, and keeping, but how real estate agents are that resource. And I don't think that's actually put out there enough on how much. Now, I know that. Right. Uh, the appraisers know that. The, the home inspectors know that because you're, you're referring business to them. But I think there, there's a lot of people out in the peripheral that, that don't know that. And I think we need to be better. Yeah. And that's either with Florida Realtor or NAR or NIFAR. They need to actually get on campaigns to get out there and, yeah. and promote just that. Well, How- and I think it's because of the shows like <laughs> the Million Dollar Listing and HGTV and all that. Mm-hmm. It shows, I think, an unrealistic um, story of what real estate is, and mm-hmm. it's, it's just not that at all. So right. There's the fun part of it, and yes, I've sold some beautiful million dollar homes, um, but was that an easy deal to do? No. <laughs> yeah. So. The, so uh, some of the flip flipping ones are, are good because when they tear open the wall and there's a bunch of termites yeah. or ro- roaches or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That, I mean, it's good entertainment. Yeah. Um, but at the end of the day, it's it's advising and consulting and just being that trust, that trusting professional for your customer is is the key. I was, I was uh, trying to I'm going to remuster my la- my last go to question. Okay. Well. I want you, if you can express here in 30, 60 seconds mm-hmm. or whatever, whether it's an agent out there that may be listening to this and say, geez, I resonate with, with Carrie. She sounds like a cool person. Mm-hmm. Maybe I need to pick her brain or, or how, really just how important is it for agents to, um, to, to get out and actually interact with each other? I think so, I think, think so many have gone to, a lot of workers have gone, they've gone home mm-hmm. And they're interacting with their families or maybe their neighbors or that sort of thing, people in their circle, maybe their kid's sporting event. But they actually really need to go out and interact with other agents and talk some of the, what do you call it, the water cooler talk. How are you handling the NAR lawsuit? That kind of conversation. How, think, do you think that's important? Uh, yes and no. Okay. Uh, true, true truth. <laughs> I think that... If you are looking to have purposeful conversations at a networking event with a bunch of realtors that have maybe only been in the industry for six months, I don't know if that's your time best spent, right? right. Those six monthers need to be using the two ears versus, right. yeah. Right. So <laughs> what, what, when what I mean by that is, hey, and if you've been in the industry for only six months, like, good for you. Definitely get a coach or go to a brokerage where you get training. But what I mean is you should be going to masterminds and masterminds I think are an incredible tool for agents that are like-minded goal oriented values align and can bounce ideas off of each other and say, Hey, what's going on versus I've seen it where there's just a lot of events where they're just go at a happy hour and they're not really having purposeful conversations. Mm-hmm. Yes. You should be talking to other people that are in the industry, but be careful and make sure that who you're actually listening to and talking to because it that really does matter like you said you are the sum of the five people you spend the most time with so who are you talking to who are you going to happy hours with i think there's definitely a collaboration that can happen but you need to make sure that your goals align where can they find these masterminds they're all over are you talking the national one well keller williams has masterminds within our brokerage based on like different tier levels so if Mm. you are hit this much in volume but there's masterminds all over there's the really good ones they can cost a pretty penny you're 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 sitting in a room with people who are it's much bigger than just you and being a part of something that's bigger than you but in terms of if you're local here in jacksonville i would start with your brokerage and say hey do we have any masterminds going on because there might be a colleague that sits next to you that has the same volume as you that might be going through the same thing as you and you you are a lot more like-minded than you than you think i think kind of start there yeah and then but make sure it's the right room (laughs) <laughs> no, that, that's, I was just thinking like how, how it would function, but there's, you, there's lots of books on how to run a mastermind yeah. or how to, you know, get, get it going. Cause once it gets going, it yeah. rolls, it's just getting it going. But I think that statement you just made was obviously not only obviously obvious, but brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> Many people don't think about that. They're just like, Oh, let's get a mastermind. Let's get a bunch of people together. But a lot of times, especially you get a bunch of agents that are less than a year together in a room. They're just all sitting around having a cocktail. It's, 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 it's yeah. time, time is money. And on, for me, just being in the industry for 10 years, having a family, like being away and, 
time, you have to, I have to be really purposeful with who I spend my time with. Mm-hmm. And so I think anyone in this industry should always think that as well, is if you're spending an hour or two hours with these people, are they the right people to be in the room? It's just a good rule of thumb. And even, I, I'm just thinking, the, you said the, the expense. I, I know the guy who coached me on podcast, I knew nothing about podcasting. Mm-hmm. He spent thousands, tens of thousands of dollars um, going to places like Puerto Rico to be around, you know, paying ten, twenty thousand dollars to join. Not saying you need to do that, but if someone is asking for a few dollars for their time and they have the credibility, yeah. and this is someone, it, it's worth to absolutely. to go and taste it. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Like you said, are we overpaid? Well, are our agents overpaid? If they're utilizing and trying and using some of that money to be, continue their education, right? You know, if they're trying to do everything, I think obviously you and I know they get that ten ninety nine for ten thousand dollars, and they've spent ten thousand and one, you know, on whatever yeah. they're doing, they and not actually buy a new car. Yeah. go buy a new car. They're not putting some money aside for yeah. education yeah. and and so forth. Well, How like health insurance, four hundred one ks. I mean, most realtors mm-hmm. only make fifty six thousand dollars a year, and right. that's not a lot. I'm saying not a lot of agents even make that much, and there's no health insurance, there's no 401k. These consumers see these big checks, but it just it just depends on what the agent is doing. Yeah, I trust uh, what I've been uh, talking about in the last few podcasts. Because in my little gift bag, there is a nice journal for you. Mm, thank you. Is to start actually writing down each day. Spoke to this client for 30 minutes yeah. about whatever. Because how many times at eight o'clock at night, and I, I've seen this numerous times in my household. You're having a conversation. They're call- it's, it's an eight o'clock conversation because you know your clients, you know, on the edge. Right. You want them to be able to sleep tonight. Yeah. So they're calling you and spilling everything into you, mm-hmm. and a lot of it's like there's nothing you're going to do tonight. You can you right. could have this conversation eight o'clock in the morning, but you're having it eight o'clock at night, so at least they can sleep. Right. Because it is stressing them out. Whatever. Yeah, it's overwhelming. Yeah, overwhelming to them. But we're not charting that. We're not putting that in our. Va- you know, this is things that we that yeah. agents deal with. Right. And I think agents should take journalize and show just like an attorney does. Every time you call the attorney, and yeah. of course they're rounding it up either to the half right. hour to the hour. Yeah, they write everything down. Yeah, and they're you're writing everything to every conversation, and they're and they're rounding their time. And because one of the conversations is should agents charge by the hour? Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. yeah. I don't think they want. I don't think people want to see no. that. Yeah, because there's a lot of conversations that are had that are sometimes at eight o'clock at night nine o'clock at night and again over the 10 years I've definitely tried to set the tone of hey like you teach people how to to treat you so if you if someone calls you at 10 o'clock at night and you answer you're teaching them that they can do that right so I I always tell my my customers hey I will answer the phone if we have a closing the next day or what if it's but if not like we'll talk the next morning and they completely understand <laughs> yeah, they have to text you 911 yeah. <laughs> yeah. let you know oh my god this is the end of the world that you need to call me back yeah Yeah. no i i I agree and and a lot of top agents that you guys do it i'm sure a little differently how you present it because your personalities but yeah yeah you find out over time and to have 57 transactions you know in in 12 months that's a lot i think uh carrie carpenter she had 10 transactions going on at the same time last year oh my god i mean bouncing all over the place yeah Yeah, 100 percent. anything you want to add uh, no. Did just, we not talk about? No, I think we hit everything. Yeah, so we did go I down. We you hit NAR. For having me. We talked about the property bear uh, and, and working with the institutions. Mm-hmm. Those are the key things we want to do. So yeah, yeah. No, this has been great. Appreciate you, and I know we've been talking for quite some time. So yeah. it's nice to finally connect. Well, it is always. I always have the open door. Something's out there to everyone. I. I I haven't done one here recently where we're doing it at the beginning of the year, my, what I call mortgage updates, uh-huh. where I don't do it, if, I don't send it out to Apple podcast, but where we just stream live and, and talk about a subject because we have a lot of different things going on in our insurance, this in our lawsuit, whatever it yeah. is that, you know, just word that you want other agents to, or, the, or, or even just your, your fans watching. So appreciate you. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you. Thanks, Carrie. Okay.